There we go. Perfect. Um, and so, you know, this probably goes without saying, but what kind of instrumentation, you know, do you need? Um, you know, you have to be able to, to, to mass select, um, you have to be able to fragment and then, you know, something higher resolution, at least as of now, I mean, there's, there's been talk, uh, in the past and some, some data with, with iron trap, um, uh, DIA, uh, I think there's probably still some future for that, um, as traps get faster. Um, and so I think that'll be something interesting in the coming years. Um, and, and for, you know, for, for maybe smaller windows, um, and kind of a more targeted DIA. Um, but I think that's, you know, if, if that were to happen, it could open up, a uh, the iron traps to do this. And then that really is, I think, a, a cheap way to get into it. Um, we'll talk about, uh, speed sensitivity, you know, what's better, you know, of course, both, um, Lots of data issues. Uh, so the Astral is a new thermo instrument, um, and it is uh, it generates lots of data. Even for those used to TimSoft, it generates a lot of data. Uh, so it's about twelve gigs an hour when it's when it's running full out, uh, and so that's uh, you know um, issues on its own with, with that. So um, so this is my. If anybody's ever seen it, anybody seen Tin Stuffle? Nobody's seen. Is it just me? There's no such thing as a free lunch. And so, uh, and, and I, I probably should have said this after lunch because, you know, Thermo's providing lunch and I, I don't, I don't want to go there, but, uh, you know, sometimes when they say, when you can't figure out what the product is, you are the product. And so maybe that's, maybe that's it. Yeah. But it's a, it's a balance of, uh, of, of things. And, uh, I, I'll, I'll throw this up to, to, to start. And so this, this is our, um, our DIA kind of standard slide that, that we've been uh, operating under, uh, you know, so you can, you can see you, you quadruple uh, isolate some mass window, you fragment, and then you have um, chromatograms that contain the precursor and the fragment ions. You can see where they align. Um, you know, we, we typically do this in our, or recommend to our customers when we have, you know, more samples. Um, serum plasma definitely works better with this. Uh, and in the proteome depth, we we initially were saying four to five thousand. This is kind of when we were using the scaffold DIA, and so now, uh, you know, on our systems, this is is in the you know six seven thousand protein range, um, uh, kind of uh, regularly. Um, but that number is essentially doubled, and so new instrumentation, you're looking at, you know, nine thousand plus proteins um, identified, and most of them quantified. Um, there are some complications um, with DIA. Um, you know, one is that you're you're dealing with ions where you're you're not optimally fragmenting everything, um, and that's not as bad of a problem as as I thought it was going to be. Um, Underfragmented ions are actually kind of nice because sometimes you'll you'll have a uh, a larger you know Y ion, sometimes a B ion, but mostly a larger Y ion um, that gets you into um, mass space or uh, mass to charge or Thompson space. The, the, the Thompson as a unit came out when I was in school. And so I, I struggle to remember that Thompson's a thing. I've just gotten out of the habit of saying daughter iron and I, I now say fragment iron all the time. Uh, but I, I forget about Thompson's. Um, but it, it pushes you to a big fragment uh, that where the noise is less. And so that can actually be beneficial. Um, of course, there's, you know, multiple peptides. And so, the, you know, the, the complexity is there. And, and one problem on older instruments, uh, especially, uh, are edge effects with quadrupoles. Uh, now, the newer instruments, this is this is not as much of an issue, but early on, it certainly was um, lots of artifacts because they're, you know, as much as we like to to think of as a square wave uh, for mass isolation, there there are edge effects, um, and the segmented quads, um, you know, kind of over the last decade have really helped. I think. Um, people with first generation QEs may have to, to chime in, but, um, I, I think they're probably still good enough to, to, to do it. Um, the early DIA data, uh, was kind of driven by the, the TOF instruments. Um, SIAX did, you know, did, did a lot of this. Um, one of the things that they realized was if, if you look at the, the purple trace at the bottom here, we've got the, you know, from all peptides across, you know, 400 to 1200 Thompson's uh, and, you know, it's more dense, you know, between 400 and 800. 
Uh, and so they realized that you could have smaller windows uh, during that range and bigger windows up top. You know, if that doesn't look familiar, that probably means you've got a thermo instrument and there's a there's a patent on that. So uh, but it uh, doesn't keep you from doing it, but I think keeps them from having standard methods that do it. Uh, and then uh, to issue whether software uh, likes that or not. And so um, we haven't done it, but we probably should um, having larger uh, windows in the, the top of the mass range. And so. Um, the, the edge effects on quadrupoles were, were really bad early when these, uh, um, first instruments were using four or five Thompson windows, um, in the, the concentrated region, um, because, you know, basically a Dalton of that, uh, or Thompson of that was, um, was suffering from edge effects. And one thing that, that was realized fairly early on was that there, there are regions uh, forbidden zones for peptides where you don't see the mass. And this is because we've got, you know, because the elemental composition of, of what peptides are made of, there are certain masses that you just don't see um, unless you're a non-standard peptide. Um, and so uh, glycopeptides, uh, you know, are, are not going to um, really fall with, with this because the ratios are a little bit different. But um one thing you have to be aware of as we start to do PTMs is that uh, phosphopeptides actually deviate from this a bit. Uh, and so phosphopeptides can actually fall into, uh, into some of these um, forbidden zones. And so just something to, to be aware of if you're doing uh, phospho DIA. Uh, show of hands, anybody, anybody doing phospho DIA regularly? One? It's it's something we we keep saying we're going to do, but we just haven't yet. Uh, and so be be curious to to compare notes maybe later. Um, uh, this is just a, a an image of the of the orbit trap. This is a, a fusion, uh, and I just show this to to kind of make sense of the next slide. Uh, I'm going to talk about about fill times and scan times. And so uh, in the orbit trap, uh, you're able to. Uh, collect and hold on to ions uh, before they they go into the orbit trap, and so it's a way of kind of bucketing ions while you're scanning. Uh, you can, can can store ions, um, and this is uh, this slide's pretty old, but I think it it still holds pretty close to uh, the transient length needed for a certain resolution. Um, I don't know, somebody may may know better than me on on speed. It may be a little bit faster than this now. Um, but at, at 15,000, that, that takes 32 milliseconds uh, of transient time. So it's got to, to measure in the orbit trap. It has to measure that ion current for 32 milliseconds in order to, to have a readout of, of 15,000 resolution. And this is the you know, thermos definition of, of resolution at, at master charge 200. Um, and so for this 32 milliseconds, uh, you have... Uh, a, a fill time of approximately 22 milliseconds. And so there's about a 10 millisecond overhead. And I think it's actually a little more than that. Um, and that's the amount of time that it takes to get the ions out of the trap and uh, to, to fly into the orbit trap before they're starting to be detected. Um, and you can see as you, as you go up to, to longer scan times, you know, it's, it's really kind of negligible. So, you know, by the time you get up to to 60,000, you know, it takes uh, 128 milliseconds to generate the transient. And, you know, still that, that 10 millisecond overhead doesn't hurt you as much. It's only 10% of the um, of, of the uh, scan time um, for a 60,000 resolution. Um, but as you scan these things faster and faster, the, the overhead becomes, becomes significant. Um, but another thing to note is, you know, if you've got an old QE that runs at 12 hertz, it's still fine, right? I mean, I think that's what, 17,500 was their resolution spec. Um, and so it's enough time that you can still get uh, about 40 milliseconds to 30, uh, maybe that's a 45 millisecond uh, transient time, something like that. So, you know, you're looking at 30 plus milliseconds of fill time, which is reasonable um, given the given the window. So the, the, the sensitivity you know, in theory, it should be there. And um, Dennis is actually going to show some data from uh, doing uh, QE, uh, DI on, on QEs. Um, but just because the instrument's old doesn't mean that it, that it can't do it. And I, I would actually probably argue now that um, older instruments are more effective doing DIA than they are DDA. Um, and so I, I think it, it, it would definitely help. 
um, <laughs> scan speed and chromatography. So this is a this is an issue. There's a, a paper that's just come out in Jasmus um, that that looks at um, its small molecule quantitation, but it but it basically asks the question. You know, do you need 20 points across the peak for for quantitation? Uh, that's uh, you know, if I if I took a poll of everybody, how many points across the peak do you do you need? I'm going to guess Mike's going to say 15. Is that right? 15. Okay. Um, I, I asked a, a former student of mine this week who does um, quantitation in a clinical assay, and he's like, oh, at least 12, at least 12. Um, I, I've always been the seven camp. You know, I'll settle for five, but I'd like to have seven. Um, and this paper showed that the difference between 20 points and seven points uh, was less than 1% in accuracy. And so I think, you know, seven's pretty good. I, I wish they had thrown in even fewer data points. You know, in their mind, they were probably going, you know, you, you can hear the argument, right? Somebody's going, well, let's do seven. What? Nobody's going to do seven. Let's do nine. Nobody's going to only want seven points across the peak. Proteomic DIA people need to look this down to, to three because there's a lot of data that's being generated with just a handful of, of points across the peak. And so it's a, it's a big issue. And so, um, you know, what I have here, you know, mass range, fill time and scan speed are going to affect your DIA cycle time. How many times you're scanning through and getting that, you know, that data point. Um, and, and really this has to fit with your chromatography and, you know, sub micron particles and, and, you know, long columns, you can get super narrow peaks. Um, and so your, your instrument has to be fast enough to scan across it. And so it's a, it's a balance of, of fitting your chromatography with your system. Uh, and I think oftentimes that's, it's not appreciated as much as it, as it should be. Um, this is uh, data from an Astral. So the new, uh, new thermal instrument, um, courtesy MS Bioworks. Um, and this is the MS scan in the Orbi uh, across a fairly narrow peak. Um, you get an Orbi scan every 0.6 seconds. And you might think, well, you know, a high resolution scan takes hundreds of milliseconds. Why would you waste time doing MS scans? You're not wasting a lot of time uh, because it's essentially doing this in the background. So it's, you know, you're doing a scan uh, and then the, the work is being done on the astral. Um, it only takes the, the, all it really costs you is the fill time for that ion. So in this case, it's about two milliseconds. Uh, and so, you know, you, you're paying two milliseconds of, of duty cycle for an MS scan. But you can see it's a nice chromatographic peak, you know, plenty of points across the peak. But when you look at, at DIA data, it doesn't look as good. Um, and so here's a, a fragment ion uh, from that. Um and you know, not many points across the peak. And so this is a uh, a 200 nanogram load of K562 uh, that's running on a um, 100 sample a day method. So essentially uh, 15 minute cycle time. And you can generate lots of IDs and you can get lots of quantitative output. Um, I'm not gonna write home about any of this, right? So if you actually look, um, you know, there are three points that are that are covering the vast majority of the quantitation. But if you look down at the baseline, you know, this is technically five points across the peak because you've got, you know, I've got numbers there, maybe even six points across the peak. But all the quantitative value is present in three of those. And, you know, 75 percent of it is present in one scan. So um, this is not optimal. Right. So uh, but if you look at this. Uh, so here's another example. Um from that same run. So here's one where the chromatography of a particular peptide is, isn't perfect. You know, nobody ever shows these chromatograms, right? So every, everybody have perfect peptides chromatograph. Nobody ever has one looks like this. Um, you, you know, there's a, there's a tail out there. And so in this one, again, you got kind of three points that are defining the quantity of the peak and then a few more in the tail. Um, you know, I, I don't care how you do the math. Um, you, you can't report, low CVs when you're quantifying like this. Um, but there are ways to, to make it better. Uh, if you take this same sample and run it on a 30 minute cycle time gradient, 
uh, instead of 15. Um, now there's plenty of points across the peak. I would might I might even argue there's too many. <laughs> um, so uh, Mike still wants twice that many, but uh, I'd be happy with a couple less. Uh, and so, you know, maybe a 20 minute cycle or 25 minute cycle, I think is, is reasonable. Uh, I should add, this is, this is a two Thompson window across about 500 Thompson's. I think it's 380 to 980 um, on the, uh, the, you know, scanning across the mass. And so um, as, as fast as that instrument scans, it, you know, you, you don't get a pass on, on matching it to the chromatography. And so just because you can run reproduce, reproducible gradients at five minutes or 10 minutes doesn't really mean that you want to. Yeah. Um, what kind of column and instrument? This is, a, um, this is an easy spray column. I don't think it's the UPAC. I think this is just an easy spray uh, and I think it's larger diameter. So uh, it's either a hundred or 150 micron um, spraying at about, I think 700 nanoliters a minute. Do you play with the temperature or you keep the standard? Yeah, so I didn't fire this data. So okay. this is, yeah, this is from MS Bioworks. Okay. Uh, but it, it is elevated temperature now. Um, so this is a, a uh, an instrument diagram of the, of the astral. And so it's my acronym at the top. Anybody guess my I'm, I'm acronym guy today? Just don't say it's a talk. <laughs> so it's a, you know, it's a it's a TOF, but it's a really really nice TOF, right? So it's a, a, a kind of a nonlinear TOF, uh, very very clever design um, to to get the ions to to move. Um, I think I guess we'll hear probably about this at lunch. Um, one of the the really impressive features. Um, is their detector uh and so they've got a, a low noise detector um essentially they've got uh a, a conversion dynode and then a photomultiplier that's in a separate vacuum space and so the the noise level is really low uh and uh, supposed single ion counting uh capabilities and so the the true novel thing to me on this TOF is that you know we think of TOFs running at high or I think of TOFs running at at high voltages uh, you know tens of kilovolts uh, and I think this runs at five or six kilovolts uh, and then has a post acceleration uh, to the detector uh, but they do a really good job of of keeping the ion cloud diffuse enough that it doesn't have ion ion interactions. Um, but tight enough and kind of the, the ion cloud gets folded in on itself um, to keep the dispersion down. Uh, and so very clever, uh, you know, newsflash, Makarov's pretty sharp. Um, and uh, this was, you know, many years in the works, um, but they, it looks to be um, pretty impressive. Um, even if it can't be run at a 15 minute cycle, you know, running it at a 20 minute cycle is still pretty impressive. Um, so you're looking at, you know, upwards of 9,000 proteins by DIA with a two Dalton window, um, you know, in 20, 25 minute cycle times. So uh, pretty impressive. Um, they give a, a little bit better picture here of, uh, of transfer time and overheads. Um, uh, the, and the reason I show this just to down to the, so the iron flight time is about two milliseconds. So in, those of us uh, who are, are TOF people think of flight times in microseconds. Uh, and so because the lower voltage and the, the immense flight path, um, it's, it's a little bit longer. Um, uh, and that's how they can get down to, you know, the 200 hertz cycle time, you know, essentially three milliseconds of overhead and then two milliseconds of flight time. Uh, and so it's pretty, it's pretty quick to, uh, uh, to turn around and do cycles. Um, my guess is at some point they're probably going to interleave this and, and make it even faster. Um, another instrument that's kind of leading the charge uh, on this is the the Timstoff. Um, uh, we have some experience and our I think our our experience in the lab isn't what everyone else's experience, but we haven't had a great experience with the Tims. Um, but the one thing that is really impressive and it, I didn't appreciate was the ion concentration factor from the uh, from the TIM cell. And this is kind of shown, uh, it's illustrated in the, in the B panel here um, where you have, you know, ions, diffuse ions for the 100 milliseconds that are, that are filling. 
and then as they concentrate themselves into a mobility distribution, you go from ions filling up 100 milliseconds worth of space to filling up five to 10 milliseconds worth of space. And so you get a 10 to 20 fold concentration increase of those ions as they strike the detector. And so being able to take, you know, diffuse ions and concentrate them is really what makes the TIM shine. You know, the reducing the complexity definitely helps as well, but just that concentration factor really is impressive. Um, and the, the, the mobility cell um, is, uh, is pretty robust. If anything, I think uh, it could, you know, could benefit from a higher capacity cell, which I guess that's what the HT is. Uh, and it may be why, uh, you know, the Andy's experience with these is, is maybe not, not like ours there. And it seems to be pretty robust in their lab and, and ours kind of not so much. We have the, the previous version, Tim's Pro 2. Um, but I think iron mobility coupled with DIA makes sense. Um, hopefully we can see it on, a, on a, an astral sometime other than in the famous variety. Um, but, uh, the, the DIA passive, um, is a, is a clever technique essentially allowing you to split up the mass range and, and mobility. Um, there's, uh, you know, new techniques that, uh, you can, uh, you can kind of scan across this a little bit more efficiently that's in the literature, but, uh, we weren't able to implement those. Um, but it, it is, uh, it is impressive to see, uh, when you're looking at these ion clouds and you see, you see an ion, um, that's present in, you know, the same mass, but a different mobility, uh, that, you know, without the mobility separation, you would never see that ion detected, uh, you know, because it's, it's close enough in mass, it's going to get, it's going to get lost under a, a big ion signal. And so, uh, dynamic range, uh, improvements are really good. And so, uh, the best data we have in our lab on DIA is from the Thames. Um, we just couldn't reproducibly get it to work day in, day out um, that we need uh, in a core to, to run. But like I said, my our experience may not be yours, um, but uh, mobility is definitely uh, an advantage. And so I come back to, to Tinstuffle. Um, and so it's it's really balancing the the sensitivity or the fill time of your instrument uh, the complexity or the mass range, you know, as the astral is fast enough, it can do a two Thompson window. Um, I might argue it may not need to, uh, if you want to run the fastest gradients, I think you can't do that. Uh, but you can run a four Thompson window and probably get really close. Um, and it's going to be, a, you know, I'm anxious to see. So, uh, uh hopefully we're going to get an astral soon. Uh, anxious to see what the, the ion capacity is, in the astral in the TOF um, to to see how how it affects taking larger windows uh, and you know you you're going to hit the ion limit sooner uh, with a with a wide window isolation um, and finally with with quantitation you've got scan speed cycle time and chronotography that are that are all coming together and so I, I described this last night as like a a four dimensional yin yang uh, and. Nobody knows, uh, nobody in our lab knows what the optimal numbers are on any of these, but it's kind of a moving target. And so if your chromatography is a certain, you know, can only be certain uh, level of, of, you know, peak capacity, then you're going to have to adjust your instrument accordingly or vice versa. If your instrument can't scan fast enough or, or needs a, a wider window, uh, then you're going to have to adjust your chromatography. Uh, and so that's, those are all kind of, you know, moving targets. Uh, again, we don't, we don't have answers. Uh, we just have questions. Um, Dennis, I don't know if you want to go through these. Um, uh, let's just, anybody have any comments for Rick and all this, uh, stuff? we want to skip over this and get to Mike. So we don't, yeah. okay. So. All right. It's oh, sorry. I'm gonna have to, sure. I'm gonna have to, um, <laughs> So in your in your experience, when I mean, so what are your thoughts on the Thames? Um, you know, using being able to use the the CCS values to help, um, you know, s solidify the you know add that extra level of confidence. Right. So, in, so it's another limiting factor for 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 ID. The thing that scares me about it is in in looking at the data. 
you'll see peptides that have a, you know, the majority of the peptide is in a, in a distribution that fits with the predicted collisional cross-section. And then you'll see another, uh, whether it's a shadow or another slight distribution that if you look at that peptide, it's the same peptide. You know, for some peptide, it's likely a structural, structural isomer mm -hmm. that just has a slightly different mobility. Um, and what worries me is that it is now in a unique collision of cross-section space where the only answer it can give is the wrong one if you can find the mobility too tightly. You're going to get the you're going to get the right answer for the for the majority of it, but knowing that there's a certain amount that's going to provide wrong answers, that that worries me. And and looking at the data, it looks like you know maybe twenty percent of the peptides have this kind of shadow peak. Um, nobody's talking about it, right? Because nobody's yeah. looking at the data. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I I worry about it. The the worry may be overblown. Uh, because there is a lot of space. If you know, if you look at at retention time, accurate mass, and mobility, that's a lot of space to cover. And so, you know, maybe they're falling in regions where it's not possible to make a misidentification. But I but I worry about that because they're they're definitely information rich spectra, right? It's yeah. that same yeah. peptide, and sometimes it's five percent, sometimes it's ten percent, sometimes it's twenty percent of the of the intensity of the major peak. Yeah. I mean, so that's, I mean, and the reason I ask is, so we, we are in the process. Um, and I say, we like the, the bioinformatics people who are much smarter than me, uh, developing our own, um, algorithm for DIA on the Thames talk, where we include the, the CCS value as part of that. And, and, you know, so we're sort of looking at, as you mentioned, you know, what are the, the tolerances we need to, yeah. to set, to do that. And, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's difficult, but, but I think that, I think there is an answer out there where that can become very powerful to. I, it, it can, it can help, you know, it can help specificity in some cases, yeah. Yeah, but I just, I, I worry about the, the yeah. wrong answers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, it's, you, you tend it's, to worry about the wrong answer more than most people, that. right? But, yeah, I'm a worrier. Yeah. yeah. Realist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. You can tell them all my facts. I'm a realist. Other questions? So I have one question uh, regarding the iron spray. Uh, so I talked to a couple of people. And uh, so is it not possible to do the protein analysis with the micro like flow? Because uh, when I talked to a couple of people in Arizona, they have the core lab, and uh, I told like I have AB SciX instrument with the micro flow. Uh, uh, so they said, "Oh, it's not possible." And then, no, it's it's yeah, it's definitely possible. So I mean, um, the what you're going to be limited in sometimes is, is sample, right? So, but the the instruments have gotten sensitive enough uh, that if the chromatography is good. Um, you know, you may, it may require you to put two micrograms or five micrograms on column instead of 200 nanograms. Okay. But if you have that amount of material, then it's fine. Yeah, because... Yeah. So uh, Brett Finney at, um, where's Brett? Uh, UC, 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 UC Davis. UC Davis. Yeah. Uh, always want to put him in San Diego. UC Davis. Um, he, he's doing um, microflow um, on their TIMS. I think at, you know microliter to a minute um, with uh, a couple hundred micron columns uh, and, and doing, yeah, just, just running that, you know, so it, robust LC system. Yeah, because I uh, purchased the standard beta uh, glucosidase from the AB SciX and I tried and I never got the results. So, you know, then I gave up like, you know, our AB SciX 5500 cannot do any because most of the protein we design in the lab and we just want to know like those transitions are there because we have the list of all the transition like we are looking for, but still the concentration never went to some uh, like 10 to the power five we look. And uh, uh, so then I gave up and yeah. Yeah, so it makes me more material. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> Just one question. You talked about the data. What I mean, what sort of infrastructure are we missing there of this onslaught of data, moving it around the lab, processing it? Uh, it seems scarier 
than the mass spectrometry side. Yeah, so, you know, data backup, and we we implemented, and I say we loosely, Aaron, implemented a uh, a NAS a network uh, accessible storage. Is that right? What a NAS stands for? Basically, network attached storage. storage. What's that, Aaron? But yeah, network attached storage. Network attached storage. Yeah. Uh, and I'm hoping when we run out of space that we're going to convince Aaron to come back and we have to buy him lunch or something, but... Uh, um, yeah, so we do this with with fast hard drives, solid state drives um, to make it, uh, you know, make it fast enough to, to run things remotely. But I think that's a necessity if you're generating these. And then you've got longer term storage problems. But um, Thermo has a, a server system that they're touting now. I don't know if they're going to talk about that or not, uh, but they have a, you know, a server system that they'll sell you for you know, price of a small country um, that that will will do that for you. Our, our speaker has her hand up. Oh, okay. Did you want to weigh in on that? Here? Yes, we will. We will cover that and uh, at the lunch session. Awesome, the free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I I had one uh, comment or question about the CCS value and the team stuff. Uh, uh, it is a uh, a new feature of a kind of a measurement, right? That we're all excited to see how to use it. But I was wondering if beyond like its relationship to increase number of IDs in the peptide level, have you guys seen if it improves the quantification or, you know, um, peptide identification across sample, like um, improves the missing value or anything? Um, or just uh, TBD to see like uh, how we can use this feature in future. I, I think it increases the IDs. I mean, you could you can you could look at this in. Um, I think it's Diane that I've done this with, where you could have a tight tolerance window, or you can either ignore it or have the window really broad, and you definitely see a difference in IDs. So okay. it, it it helps. It definitely helps in IDs. Um, uh, I, I couldn't speak any more than that. Andy may be able to. Yeah, I'd say that uh, the real answer is it's all TBD. I, I think you're right. I mean, it's still very new and and we're still trying to um, explore what's the best way to do with it. I mean, right now, I, I think that the the goal that we're setting is that it does increase our IDs a little bit and we feel like it gives us a little more confidence in, in our IDs. Um, it, it's, it's not right now the way we're using it it's not shown to to improve or, or change the the quantitation at all um uh, that i guess there's still ways we need to think about how that may or may not ever be a benefit but but right now really it's mostly used to slightly improve the ids and just maybe add that extra level of you know that other parameter that you can help to you know now now because the parameter of looking at the msms spectra with your calculator and and th that's gone so so we're trying to add as many more parameters with, with data that I still don't yeah. understand how to look at. Um, so, but yeah, so that's sort of how we're using it. Thank you. Thank you.